and hello all of you out there. Uh, I'm sorry I can't see you, but I hope you can see me all right. Uh, Elaine has done so much for so many, and uh, I want to say how appreciative I am of everything she's contributed to this movement that uh, is helpful to so many of us. I'm glad to have some time with you today, uh, Grandparents Day. I know a lot of you are suffering from being unable to see your grandchildren on this day, and I want you to know I'm one of you. I won't see my grandchildren either. I, I haven't seen any of them. I have four. I haven't seen them for the past 15 years, in fact. I haven't seen the oldest, whom I did get to know as one of her primary babysitters until she was two years old and her mother stepped in to keep us apart in all those years. She's 17 now and a lovely senior in high school. I saw the second child, who's now 15, for one day only, the day after she was born. And we went to the hospital to take her and her mother some beautifully wrapped gifts. Her mother was in the bathroom when we went to their room and she stayed there about 30 minutes, hoping we would leave apparently, while our son cradled the new child and stayed on the other side of the bed from us per his instructions and wouldn't let his mother or me hold her. That was the day his wife decided no more, just like that. We never saw either of the two children who were born in subsequent years, not once. Some of you will know that my wife, Anne, who passed away eight years ago, wrote a book about our situation, as Elaine has said. It, it's been rather famous in its own way. Uh, I think uh, Elaine mentioned the name. It's called A Son is a Son till he gets a wife, how toxic daughters-in-law destroy families. Anne tells in the book where she got her title. She was one of six children and had four brothers and a sister. The sister came home frequently, but the brothers rarely appeared. So her mother often said, a son is a son till he gets a wife, a daughter's a daughter all of her life. As I said, Anne's book has become somewhat famous. A woman in Florida was having a similar experience of, ex of ex estrangement from her grandchildren and was seeing a counselor about her program. The counselor read about Anne's book in Psychology Today magazine and suggested that the woman get a copy and read it. She did and was overwhelmed at what she read. Being a woman of high motivation, she decided that all the alienated grandparents should have an organization that dealt with their situation. So she started one called Alienated Grandparents Anonymous. It was about 10 years ago. Now, after a decade, AGA, as it is often abbreviated, has grown unbelievably, connecting with thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of grandparents in similar circumstances. Today, there are multiple chapters of AGA in all 50 states and in more than 30 foreign countries. It's really quite remarkable. I never realized how many of us long suffering grandparents there are in the world. Amanda, as that woman called herself to preserve her anonymity, spends most of her time answering people's letters and emails and telephone calls. Last year, she published a, a big, thick book about the subject of grandparent alienation, and she called it, I thought I was the only one. Obviously, she wasn't. It's understand, my understanding that Anne's book, A Son is a Son, as Elaine has said, was also responsible for her starting the organization she had, Family Access, because she and her husband Chester also went through this awful experience of being unable to be with their grandchildren. I reread Anne's book again recently myself, and I was amazed after this interval of a decade at how powerful it is. I'm so proud of her for doing it. I can't really conceive of how many grandparents it has spoken to over the years or will go on speaking to in the time ahead of us. I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a preacher in my professional life. 
a preacher and a university professor. And my, my, I myself have written a number of books about life and religion. So although I've re been retired for 45 years, I'm sorry, I don't mean 45, 25, I still often think in biblical terms. I'm thinking now a verse of scripture from one of St. Paul's letters to the people in Corinth. It's short and simple, and I'm sure you know it. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's the old King James translation of the Bible, which is the one I grew up with and still love, though I often use other translations as well. I agree with the Apostle Paul. Love is the most important thing in the world. If we all loved one another all over the world, most of our problems would be over, or even if they weren't, we wouldn't care because life would be wonderful. If we can love everybody, no matter what they've done to us or to others, we'll feel good about life. Of course, faith is important too. We need faith desperately. Faith provides a framework for expectancy in our lives, a, a way to understand our relationship to God and the future. I don't know how some people seem to live without it. I couldn't. It's, it's essential. But I want to focus now with you on the word hope. Faith, hope, and love. Faith and love are great. We couldn't get along without them, but neither can we get along without hope. We simply couldn't exist without it. We couldn't live from day to day without it. I sometimes think about all those poor people who died in the collapse of that big apartment building in Florida a few weeks ago. Not the ones who died instantly, but the ones who were buried in the rubble and might have lived a few days before they perished. What was it like for them down under all that wreckage? Did they have hope that they would be rescued? Did, did any of them think if, if I can just hold on a few years long, a few hours longer, I'll be rescued? It's awful to think about. The larger tragedy is that some people live without hope in their lives, even when they aren't trapped under a fallen building. Every day to them is dark and dreary. Things are bad for them now, and they expect them to be worse in the future. Can you imagine how bad that would be? It's bad even in a single area of our lives. Even when we think about our relationship to our estranged children and grandchildren and don't have any hope that things will ever be different. I'll testify to that. There have been times when I've simply given up hope that I'll ever have that relationship again. Fifteen years is a long time to live so near to them. Their home is only 30 or 40 minutes away from mine and never see them. I couldn't forget them. Often, whatever I was doing at the time, I would think about them and wonder what they were doing, especially my grandchildren. How were they doing in school? What were, what were they like? What would they be like when they grew up? But I didn't hear from them and I didn't see them. I guess hope more or less evaporated. It's hard to keep hoping with, when nothing seems to come of it. I prayed for them, for the whole family every night before I slept but I didn't really expect to ever have them in my life again. I think something that made my situation even worse was that I remarried four or five years after Annie died and my new wife, Gloria, had an extremely close family. She has three daughters and five granddaughters and they all talk with one another constantly, even the granddaughter who married a military man and now lives in Germany with him. I overhear their conversations several times a day, and they're always so loving and embracing. Maybe it's why Anne named her book A Son is a Son Till He Gets a Wife. She said in the book it was something she always heard from her mother, as I said, who had four sons and two daughters. A son is a son till he gets a wife, a daughter's a daughter all of her life. I often remember that when I overhear Gloria's conversations with her daughters. 
I don't think a nuclear bomb could ever come between those women. But one evening, just a few months ago, out of the blue, the phone rang. And it was my son calling to ask how I was. We chatted for a few minutes before he said he had to go and would call again. For three or four weeks, I had a brief call every few days. Then there was an interval when I didn't hear from him at all. And then one night, a couple of months ago, he phoned and said, Dad, would you like to meet for coffee at such and such a place tomorrow morning? Boy, would I. I could hardly believe it. I, I had suggested a couple of times in my emails to him that we might meet sometime for coffee or a meal, but he never seemed to hear and it didn't happen. He just ignored it. Now, here he was asking me to meet him. He arrived at the designated meeting place before I did and was waiting for me when I got there. It was a lovely temperate day and we sat at a table in a sidewalk cafe on the main street of my little town. I had to keep pinching myself several times to believe it was actually happening. Remember, I hadn't seen him for 15 years, 15 years. And I didn't even have any idea of what he would look like after all that time. Now, I, I couldn't get over the changes in his appearance. He looked good. I, I commented on his muscles, and he said he works out regularly. He seemed happy and smiled a lot. The conversation was upbeat. I felt wonderful. I, I guess I had ceased to believe this would ever happen. We talked about his children, all four of them. I asked especially about the oldest, the one he had told me has lupus. I don't know much about lupus. He said it affects the primary organs of the body and that my granddaughter often has a lot of pain from it so that she sometimes lies curled up in a little ball until she feels better. She's 17 years old now and is a senior in high school. She's been shopping around for a college that isn't too far from home so she can go back there to her room whenever the lupus gets real bad. And she can pull the shades and go to bed. I worried a lot about the lupus. A friend of mine has a daughter who's now 60 years old and has lupus. He said it's a marvel she's still alive because victims of lupus don't usually live to be that old. She has to sleep with an oxygen machine. One night, a few months ago, the tube on the machine worked loose from the mask she wears and she was unresponsive and near to death when they found her in her room. That hurts me from my granddaughter. She's awfully young to have to live with something like that hanging over her head. My son and I talked about many things that day, mostly recalling things from his childhood. He always loved holly holidays, especially Christmas, and he recounted a lot of fond memories about the Christmases when we were all home together. We also traveled a lot during his childhood. Once, when I was on leave from the university where I was teaching, we lived in Paris, France for a year. We traveled all over Europe. And I remember that he especially enjoyed the great art galleries of England and France and Italy. We would go to a gallery and later, as we were driving down the road, he would show us a drawing he just made in the back seat of something he had seen. He was only four or five then, but it was already obvious that he would be an artist when he grew up. That's what he did become. He, he's the head of a large art department in a big high school near Washington, D.C. I can't tell you how wonderful it felt to be talking to this man I hadn't seen for so many years and to see that he appeared to be happy for us to be visiting. And I felt pleased at the end of our visit when he said, we'll do this again, Dad. Maybe next time I'll bring Ellie along. Ellie's the one with the lupus. I remember walking down the street to my car after our meeting and feeling as if I were bouncing along on a column of air. I admit I never hoped for this to happen again in my lifetime, but it did. And now I'm hoping to see my son again, maybe even my granddaughter. My whole mood about the future has changed. 
and I'm living in expectancy. I, I'm living in hope. It's so much better than where I was. In case you don't know it, there are often stories like mine. Not long ago, there was a reference to the so-called success stories in a family access email. And when I told Amanda, the founder of Alienated Grandparents Anonymous, about meeting with my son, she told me that mine was the 320th success story she had recorded. The 320th. I'm sure that 320th out of all the thousands of sad stories grandparents tell isn't very much, but, but it's something. And it makes me happy for all the other grandparents who've had good news to share. Hope is a priceless thing in our lives. Did you know that even animals have it? Maybe you've seen that TV program. I think it's called Pooches Reunited, about, about dogs that have waited a long time to see their masters who've been absent from them for some reason. I remember one of them in which a man had to leave his dog behind when he went to serve in the army and spent several years overseas. I think it was five years. The picture showed the dog sitting outside the house, waiting as he always did for the return of his master. The returning soldier on this occasion approached and stood at a distance. The dog perked up. Could it be? Was it really his master he saw coming toward him? Suddenly, this dog, who was a pretty big dog, he sprang up and bounded toward the man. Then he was all over him smothering him with kisses. I, I, I think it was four or five years, and the dog had never lost hope that he would see his master again. I saw another program a few months ago about a young boy, a teenager whose dad was in prison. The boy would go and sit on the curb or lean against the building opposite the jail where his father was. He did this day after day after day. He would go after school and wait, watching the jailhouse door. In the summer, he would bring his lunch and sit there waiting for his father. He'd done it for two and a half years, I think, hoping to see his dad walk out of prison. And one day the father did. The commentator on the program said that the man's initial sentence had been for eight years. But one day, someone told the judge about the boy who was waiting for his dad's return. The judge had his curiosity piqued, so he drove by the jail and saw the boy there across from the jailhouse. A few days later, he drove by again. The boy was still there. The judge went to his office and issued a remand, cutting the prisoner's sentence to time served though it had been only two or three years. When the jailer released the man, a news photographer made a video of the father and son's reunion. The boy ran into his dad's arms just the way that dog ran to kiss his master. Isn't that a wonderful story? I remember another program about a man who'd been in prison for 22 years for killing a man, even though he wasn't guilty of the crime with which he was charged. When new evidence came to light about the real perpetrator of that crime, there was an order to release the man. A reporter was waiting outside the jail with the man's daughter to ask him some questions. One of those questions was how this man had survived all those years, knowing he'd not done the thing for which he'd been sentenced. I just prayed every day that the time would come, he said. I, I knew God would eventually answer my prayers. Eventually. So don't lose hope, no matter how long it's been since you saw your child or your grandchildren. Something that, like what has happened to those 320 sets of grandparents could still happen to you. In the meantime, what do you do with your life? How do you manage to Keep hope alive when you don't get to visit with your own grandchildren. Let me share a couple of things with you that I, I think helped me to get through those barren years when I wasn't seeing my son or my grandchildren. 
First, though not least, is my little dog, Toby. I thought you were going to get to hear from Toby a minute ago. He's here in my study with me, and apparently he heard something I didn't hear, and he got up and went to investigate, and I thought he would bark, but he didn't. Toby's a little white Maltipoo, part Maltese, part Poodle. I found him while my wife Annie was going through the hell of chemo for her cancer, and life looked very bleak for both of us. He was only two months old then, and all puppy. If anything could divert us from during those hard times from what Annie was suffering, it, it was this little wiggly ball of fluff who, from the very first, loved to race through the house, bumping into things, and eventually turning a couple of somersaults as he came to a stop. Was he ever funny and beautiful at the same time? Toby and I became inseparable after Annie died. He slept in my bed. He followed me everywhere. I didn't teach him any special tricks, but he did develop some adorable habits. He can still melt my heart when I look into his little dark eyes. It's hard to get into a little dog's mind and think the way he does, but I feel especially close to this little fellow. I take him for a walk a couple of times a day, if the weather permits. And the folks in our neighborhood are used to seeing us together. Most of them know Toby's name, even though they don't know mine. If you don't have a pet, a dog or a cat or a bird, my wife Gloria brought a pet dove into our home and He's become like one of the family. I strongly advise that you consider acquiring one, even a goldfish, if you want to go minimalist. Anything to take your mind off those precious grandchildren you don't get to see. It might even be a gecko. The important thing is that it will, it will become a distraction from your grief at not being able to see your beautiful grandchildren. And I strongly advise that you look for a pet at one of the adoption agencies. I have a friend who works for a dog pound where they care for dogs that have been discarded or disowned by their original owners. And she says her heart is several times bigger than it once was because of how much she cares for those dogs, especially the ones with big sad eyes. Another thing you can do that might help your situation is to write letters to your grandchildren the way I've done. I wrote mine several years ago when the children were younger. The one grandchild we had gotten to know learned to call me Poppy. So I call the books of these letters that were published, there are three of them, from Poppy with Love, letters from a grandfather to the grandchildren he isn't allowed to see. As Elaine said, you can order these books from Amazon.com if you're interested. They, they might inspire you to compose letters to your own grandchildren. I haven't tried to get these books to my grandchildren yet. I, I know that if I mail copies to them, their parents would probably confiscate them and destroy them without letting their children see them. Besides, I didn't want to put my grandchildren in the attention of being in a firing zone, so they might want to take sides against their parents. So I plan, I hope, to find out where the children have gone to college when they finally leave home and send copies of the books to them then. I don't want to get them in trouble with their parents. I, I just want them to know that they were loved and cared for by their grandparents during those tender years when who knows what their parents might have told them about why they couldn't see their grandparents who incidentally lived only 20 or 30 miles away from them. And speaking of hope, I've always secretly hoped that when those grandchildren read about how much their grandparents loved them, even though we could never see them, they would maybe seek us out. And we could become friends for their adult years. I'm not the only one who's chosen this way of reconnecting with grandchildren. I have a lady friend whose son and daughter-in-law and grandchildren lived all the way across the country from her. I don't remember how she learned that one of her granddaughters had gone off to college, but she wrote her a letter almost every week. 
the granddaughter was overjoyed at hearing from her and began writing back in response. Then on one of the school holidays, that granddaughter flew thousands of miles to visit her grandmother without telling her parents she did it. The two of them now have a wonderful relationship, albeit a secret one. And the granddaughter says that when she gets married, she wants to live in the part of the country where her grandmother lives so they can hopefully make up for some of the precious time they've lost across the years. Just think, you can hope for something like that in your own case. Now, another thing I suggest you think about doing to take some of the sting out of not being with your grandchildren is to consider how you might become involved in the lives of other children. For example, are there children in your neighborhood with whom you might become friends? I'm lucky to live in a neighborhood where several young couples are raising their children. One family next door to us has three small girls who are often out playing in their yard. The, the oldest is about 10 now, one is about six, and the smallest is only four. They love my little dog, Toby, and they always run out to the street to see us when they see me walking him past their house. Toby loves them, and they love him. The littlest girl, whose name is Eliana Grace, isn't that a beautiful name, Eliana Grace, always squats down with Toby and puts her arms around him and cuddles him as she looks up and grins at him. He's so soft, she says, that as she strokes him. I may have missed such beautiful moments with my own grandchildren, and I regret that I have, but I am grateful for this ongoing connection with these three little girls. You can also become involved with groups of children in your church or community. I know one woman whose grandchildren live on the other side of the country, and she works with a group of preschoolers at Sunday school in her church so she can have them in her lives as substitute grandchildren. And most community schools would welcome assistance with their children's programs, both during and after school hours. All you have to do is to go to the principal's office and explain that you would like to volunteer to help with activities. And most school offices are offices are happy to sign up anybody who's willing to become involved this way. There are women at the library where I go who are often there after school hours and on Saturday mornings, usually with a little group of children around them as they read to them or tell them stories while showing them pictures in the books they're holding. The point is that anything you can do to become involved with children or young people will make your isolation from your own grandchildren more tolerable. It won't totally substitute for being with your own descendants, but it will help if only because it will divert you from thinking about them. You will regret not having a good relationship with your own family members, but the regret will be dulled or ameliorated by your association with other young people. Now, finally, offer prayers for your grandchildren and their parents. Try to forget your animosity for your child and his or her spouse, if you have any, and hold them and your grandchildren up to God. Maybe you can't see your grandchildren, but you can hold them up to God. And while you're at it, pray for other people who may be in the same situation with their grandchildren. Let's all pray for one another. We talked about faith, hope, and love. Well, this is where faith and love come in. Your faith is important to you. You want it for your children and your grandchildren as well. So you commit all of you to God. And as you do this, you're acting in love, not hate or vengeance or any of the other things that would be so natural under the circumstances. Let love take over your life and your consciousness.
You can love everybody in spite of the way you're being treated. In fact, you can love the world. You can love everybody and everything. If you do that, it will diminish your sense of loss and make it less important to you for you will have a feeling of God's holding it all in God's hands, which is where everything ought to be. I think I have a few more minutes. If I do, I want to tell you about a little book you might want to read. It's by Joseph Gerzon, G-I-R-Z-O-N-E, Gerzon. And it's called The End of Suffering. Joe Gerzon was a friend of mine. We met many years ago. Joe was a Catholic priest. He went to the seminary when he was only 14 years old. and He grew up in the Catholic seminary and became a priest. And after he retired from the priesthood, he began writing books into which he distilled a lot of the experience he had had as priest. One of these books called Joshua is the story of Jesus as a man living in modern times. That book was a huge hit. And Joe continued writing about Joshua, book after book. This is how I came to know Joe. I was chairman of a committee at a university where I was teaching then. We were charged as a committee with planning and assembling a spiritual life program for the students at the university. You've probably been in such program if you were went to university. I just read the first Joshua novel and I was so smitten by it that I suggested as it was such a truly spiritual story that we invite Joe to come and be one of the speakers in our program. We did and Joe agreed to come. The university I was teaching in happened to be a Baptist school and they had never had a Roman Catholic as a speaker, certainly not a priest wearing a collar. I wasn't sure how Joe would be received in such an environment. This is down in the South and most of the Baptists down there were uh, pretty fundamentalists and pretty uh, persuaded that this was the only way. So afraid that Joe wouldn't be happy being there on his own, Instead of having him stay at the hotel where I had the other speakers stay, I invited Joe to come and stay with my wife and me in our home. We had a wonderful visit. It was over several days, three or four days. And we got to know one another during those days we were together. Incidentally, Joe was a big success with both the students and the faculty. Everybody was happy he had come. A few years after that, my wife Ann and I drove up to visit Joe in his spacious home in New York State. And we had a wonderful time with him. He was such a gracious host. I remember that while we were there, Joe received a check from one of his publishers for $75,000. Now, that seems like a lot to me. My books have never made that kind of money. Uh, I read somewhere that the Joshua novels, all of them together, and there were about seven altogether, that they earned about $3 million, if you can imagine that. Anyway, Joe, while we were there, got a check for $75,000. Within an hour of receiving that check, Joe was on the telephone to some sisters in a nunnery out in California that was being threatened with closing down for lack of money. And he donated the whole amount of that check to the nuns so they wouldn't lose their home. That was the kind of man Joe was. I want to recommend a little book of his that I ran across on my bookshelves recently. I don't remember when I bought it or if I even bought it. Uh, now, I'm getting old and my memory isn't what it used to be. Uh, I have a lot of trouble with it. And so that may fall into that category. I think Joe must actually have sent my wife and me a copy of the book because it has a lovely inscription to us in the front of it. But I'd apparently put it on the shelf when it came in or somebody had put it on the shelf. And I don't think I ever read it then. 
It's called The End of Suffering. It's not a very big, big book. I, I think it's only 140 pages or so. It's only so thick. But I read it when I found it recently, and I want to recommend it to you. It deals with all kinds of suffering, suffering in childhood, suffering from pain, suffering from loneliness, suffering from working in a bad workplace, all kinds of suffering. It doesn't talk about suffering because you can't see your grandchildren. I'm not sure if Joe ever counseled grandparents with our problem, but I expect he did. But he didn't maybe know enough about suffering because you don't see your grandchildren, so he didn't write about that. When you read the book, you remember all the kinds of suffering around us in the world, all the kinds of hardship people are having to deal with. And right now, especially with this COVID uh, virus going around the world again and again, with the flooding that's gone on in this country from the hurricane, and with uh, uh, everything that's happened, the, the uh, losses of jobs, uh, the difficulties so many people are having. When you read about all of them, most of them are actually worse than not being able to see your grandchildren. You have to admit that I had to admit it. When I finished reading this book a few days ago, I read only a few pages a day. I sat back and thought about how I miss seeing my own grandchildren. And then I put that up against the suffering of all the people that Joe tells about in the book. It helps me to put my own hurting and suffering in perspective. I think it might do the same for you. Joseph Gerzone, G-I-R-Z-O-N-E, The End of Suffering. You can order it, I'm sure, from Amazon.com if it isn't in your local bookstore. Someday, all of this will be over and God will gather us home to be with him and all the dear grandchildren of the world. Until then, God bless you, my friends, and God bless your wonderful grandchildren. I hope that your day hasn't been spoiled because it's grandparents' day and you're not with them. God be with you.